was, you could have expected it. So, can you please come in and close the doors for June door? Please close the door. Thank you. So, uh, when preparing uh, such a conference, uh, it's not only one or two people to decide who is on the program and what is on the program and who is the speaker, but what we do is sitting together with the national team responsible people and the national, our national coaches and discussing what are interesting topics and what are speakers we should invite. And there was a very, very, very strong recommendation of our national poll team to invite our next speaker. And they said, this is great knowledge, what we need for our daily training. Christina, what was that about? Who the you? No, it was your recommendation and you told me our next speaker, he was in your event group meeting last week and once again you were excited about what he did. And as far as I know, you've been, you used to be a judo guy before and, and a long time ago at an international level and now working as a physiotherapist, as a conditioning coach, and as a consultant and speaker to many international associations, federations, organizations. And uh, maybe what you do, you better explain yourself. Thank you very much for being here this morning, Roman Yoba. Thank you very much. So before I start, don't worry, we'll finish about 30 to be in time, on time, at lunch. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself, uh, Roman Yavoda. I was born in Czech Republic. I was raised in Austria, so I'm Austrian, and living in Switzerland now for four years. Um, as I said, I was a judo fighter. My colleague from Complex School was an Olympic judo coach, so we come from the judo family. Um, and. Yeah, we were collecting experience in sport and physiotherapy from different views as an athlete, as a physio, as a coach. And um, so in the last 10, 15 years, we developed our system complex core. Very short, well this complex core is nothing new that we invented. All we did, we collect, collected all uh, exercises, training methods together, try to systemize it. So every coach uh, finds the correct training topics and exercises for each athlete. So to make it simple, when you look at the, look at the internet, everything is very complex, complicated. So we try to make it very simple. And what Martin said, what Herbert said, um, was very nice to see, to start with the basics and then go to the specifics. And this is our view, and we see with many athletes that um, they don't bring a lot of performance in their sport because of lack of basics. So we are trying to help on the basic field to then improve in the specifics. If you are an athlete who is very strong but very stiff, of course you will not perform well in high jump. So for us it's important, as Martin said many times, step back and see the big picture. And this is our approach. So what do we do with Complex Core? Uh, as you heard, we teach at several universities around the world. We teach in Tokyo, we teach in North America, across Europe. So we travel around, educate physiotherapists and fitness coaches. Um, we take care also of companies, about employees, occupational health is one of our topics. And of course, we take care of athletes. Um, I was working for eight years. I was the personal coach of Rob Schumacher, who lived in Salzburg in Austria. Uh, when I was there. Uh, from there, it went next step. I worked for the Formula One drivers like Kobayashi, Gutierrez. Last year, I was a trainer with Rutenberg. Um, when I started to become, to be a physio and fitness coach, I worked with volleyball girls for five years in Austria. Then it came into soccer. So I became the Austrian head coach for the referees, not only to raise the red and yellow card, but also with all their training topics, running backwards, all the things. 
And then I went, I become the head physio of UEFA. So now in Switzerland, for 12 years now, I work for UEFA um, to develop testing, uh, screening tests, training methods, how to improve, injury prevention, and so on. And yeah, in Switzerland, I'm also taking care of sailing, of the Alindi sailing team, who became twice the America's Cup winner. So it's not like I'm bored, that's why I do so many things. I do so many things because I think it's important to collect a lot of different experience to see the big picture. Because I see like soccer coaches, they are good soccer coaches, but they see just the soccer world. And we are trying to open their view to tell them if you do maybe volleyball specific exercises with the soccer players, they might get better. And not to stand for proprioception always on the leg and shoot the ball, which they do every time. Do other loads, other exercises, other input to improve, adapt, and become better. So I'd like to show you some uh, pictures, some stories to understand our approach. And in the afternoon, we'll do it very active to show you for pole vault and high jump some active approach for the topics mobility, flexibility, stability, and so on to really specific positions and movement. So, 80% of all human beings have at least one time in a lifetime some back pain. So what do we do Typ typically in physiotherapy? We massage, we give something warm, take a hot bath, you feel better, okay, I'm happy, but maybe you feel better just for a few hours, maybe just for a day, and it comes back. So it's not the solution. The same thing with athletes who work over, over head, handball, volleyball, even pole ball, if they have shoulder problem. It doesn't mean that the problem is right in the shoulder. The problem can be somewhere else. The same thing is for the lower extremity. Soccer players shooting the ball, coming to the physio. Ah, oh, it hurts here. I will not push around and try to find the spot with the ultrasound whatsoever. Maybe the main reason for this problem is somewhere else. So, what shall we do? Actually, there is no medication we swallow when we are healthy for our whole lifetime. The only thing that actually helps is the active movement, active training of the structures. And everything we do starts in the center of the whole body, in the core. So if I have an athlete, let's go to the uh, lower extremity, a runner who run, likes to run in the forest, every time he runs, he steps on part of the forest, on the tree, and has an ankle problem. Comes to the therapy, oh, my ankle hurts, it's unstable. Of course, I can try to work on his ankle, but maybe it's not the main reason. Maybe the main reason is a lack of core stability. Maybe it's a lack of pelvis stability, that he loses the stability from here, that the pelvis falls down, he loses the axis of the leg, and then he loses the stability of the ankle joint. So it's important to see the big picture. The same thing for the upper extremity. If an athlete, for example, weightlifter, who says, oh, my wrist hurts. Of course, I can look at his wrist and check what's going on. But before I check his wrist, again, I go to the basics, check the core, check the shoulder blade, then the shoulder joint, and then move to the outside. You have always to see the whole muscle chains, the big picture of the activity. We have two goals when we talk about core training. The one is prevention of injuries and the other one is performance. It doesn't mean performance for athletes and prevention for all the patients. It can be also the other way around. All the patient can collect his flowers in his garden. Maybe he can make it faster or without pain. That's also performance. And injury prevention is always a big topic in sports. So when I always talk about core stability, core mobility, how important that is, mostly soccer coaches are coming to me and saying, well, I know it's important, but we don't have time. We have the games, we have the training sessions, they have to do running, they have to do everything else, but we don't have that much time for that. And that's the wrong attitude. Core training should be part of every training session. It should be part of the warm-up. And if we talk about core training, it doesn't mean, okay, let's do it for two hours. No, we are talking about 5 to 15, 20 minutes. But every training session. Um, I see sometimes people going to the gym, some ladies, guys, 
to the private gym and staying there for three, four hours. I don't know what they're doing for three, four hours, but you cannot train that long. If you have an intense uh, core training session, then even a top athlete is done after 20 minutes. So there is no core training for an hour or 45 minutes. Do a core, a core circuit, 20 minutes, it's done. We have, hopefully not in sports, but we have sometimes patients, people who don't like to move, don't like sports. So when I see this patient in my clinic, I tell him, okay, see the big picture first, maybe lose weight to get rid of your back pain. The second thing is, of course, he has to work on strength to improve and to stabilize. But strength is not everything. Imagine a guy, a bodybuilder, who builds up his chest and bicep or whatever. He will be strong on one side, but he will not be able to take the ball and throw it very far because his muscles are not used to work together with the other muscles. So here we are talking about functionality, and we should understand we are not training muscles, we are training movements. And that is the goal of the functional training. So always see the movements and not individual joints or individual muscles. Of course, if somebody had a surgery on the knee and the vastus medialis is gone, then we'll start to activate it locally, just one muscle. But then, as soon as possible, see the big picture, train the movements and not individual muscles. Core has a very important function. When you look at the bobsled, uh, uh, bobsled athletes, if you've seen one in real life, there are huge guys, like athletes in hammer, throwing big guys. If the athlete, when he pushes the ball, would be weak, so in the core, he would not be able to perform 100% the, the forces from the legs into the arms. He would get lost somewhere. So the core stability has an important function. The transfer of the forces from the legs to the arms and from the arms to the legs. So some athletes just lose it in the center. So sometimes when you analyze athletes, we think too complex, too complicated. Sometimes for complex questions, we have simple answers. Go back to the basics. Get him out of the sport, work on the basics for a few weeks, and then get him back and see the difference. I will show you then some examples. So what should you do before you give some new exercise and whatsoever to your athlete? The first thing, you have to do tests. You cannot just say, well, I saw a cool exercise on YouTube, let's do it. You can do it, maybe it's fun, but there is no structure. We are talking about periodization and everything. It has to be structured. So of each athlete, we should know what are his strong and weak parts. Is he a stiff person, is he a weak person, is he a problem with the hip joint, and so on. So we have to test. After the testing, when we talk about core training, Forget the idea of six-pack. Six-pack has nothing to do with good course stability. When we talk about core training, the first thing is the mobility of the spine. And nowadays, we see that most of the athletes, they are not weak. They do some sports, they have some basic strength and stability, but most of the new generation are just stiff. Sitting, video games, and so on. So if you have, when we do muscle functional tests, and physiotherapy with the athletes, they are, there's a big difference between them and the old generation. They are getting more and more stiff, and to perform better, the mobility is one of the main topics. So when I have an athlete, first I work on mobility and flexibility, before I tell him, yeah, let's do some core stability. So mobility part one. Then when we talk about core stability, and it was my thing in judo, we had the weight, uh, control in the morning, so half-naked guys in the room, and you see before the uh, fight, everybody was losing weight, so no fat, nothing, no drinking for two days, so everybody in the six-pack looked like Hercules standing there, I was in the room like, oh my god, so many strong guys, but what's the fact that of all these guys in the room who had a six-pack, at least 40% had back pain. And the coach is asking him, so why does he have back pain? Look at him. He looks so defined, he looks so strong. But the six pack has nothing to do with stability of the spine. So it's not the global system we are talking about, it's the local system. The pelvic floor, the diaphragm, transversus, and so on. So for you, when you have an athlete who looks fit, but he can have back pain, 
You don't have to solve the problem, but send it to the physiotherapist so he works on the local system, so he understands how to activate the deep muscles. Before starting, yeah, I think you have to do some sit-ups, it's going to be fine. No, work on the local system. I know it's difficult to activate the local system because it's not like, I got it. No, it's very soft, 15-20% of the activity to activate inside. So, we actually teach for many years now at the Spoon University here at the trainer, Trainers Academy, where we have Olympic coaches and they ask us, well, how do we, uh, how can we work on the local system with athletes or even in volleyball when I had the women who were always blocking, landing and had problems with the pelvic floor. How do you activate it? Easy system, you can try at home. Have a glass filled up with water till the edge, so it almost drips out. Tell the athlete, take the glass of water, 10 meters away, there's a second table, and for this 10 meters, you have to use at least one or two minutes, and you should not spill any water. So they take the glass, they bring it up slowly, and they start walking step by step. In here, they have the 15, 20% of the pre-activation. So that's the idea to make them understand how to activate it. The second thing is, what do we do? Hola, chicks, The th second thing we do with athletes, when we, uh, for example, work on heavy squats, skiers in Austria, big legs, the old school was always the belts to support the spine. From our, our point of view, the spine, athlete here, the spine should be stabilized by itself, not with uh, extra help, unless he's a heavy weightlifter, then okay. But what do we do? Of course, I can give him, imagine you do squats, I can give him some acoustic input, okay, pre-activate. Or, what do we do before he does squat? Don't scare yourself, stay up, stay up. He just slaps on his stomach, what does he do? Pre-activate. And now I am letting him do the squats. I just wanted to wake you up, thanks. <laughs> so, just an easy idea how to do that. How to pre-activate. There are many things. All the theory is nice, but when you go just to the physio to pre-activate, they're lying on the table and they are trying to find the transversus to activate with ultrasound. It's very complex. Try to think about some practical things. So before the athlete takes the heavy weight and does some squat with no pre-activation, he can slap himself even with by himself or give him some act, uh, acoustic input whatsoever. But the pre-activation is important. Then when the local system is doing well, then we actually talk about core training, global core stability. And it's important for each coach that you have enough variations in your mind. In our system, we have over 3,000 exercises. For the core stability, we have over 1,000. Not because we were bored, but because it's important. Martin said it, Herbert said it, body adapts very quick. If I give exercises to my athlete, I cannot tell him, see you next year, then we'll do something else. At least after four weeks, the body adapts already. So after four weeks, you have to change something. You can change the position of the exercise. You can change the weight of the exercise. You can change uh, the whole exercise. You can change the training method. It doesn't matter what you do in your system, in the system, but you have to change something. You cannot stay with the same thing for, let's say, two months. That's why we have a lot of variations. The goal of core stability is always muscle balance. As I said, the bodybuilder, when you look at the hobby bodybuilders, strong chest, six pack, but they walk like this because there is not much on the back side. So the balance between ventral system, dorsal system, and lateral system. And then we have a fourth group where we have exercises, functional training, where you activate all the systems together. And when we collect our experience from the last 15, 20 years, we see that most of the athletes, ventral is okay, back is okay, but lateral with the abductors, way too weak. <laughs> so if you have your athletes, don't forget to inc increase more activist activity of the lateral systems. And this is actually our uh, order of training. When I have an athlete, 
It's not like in the gym, you go to the fitness studio and they say, okay, on Monday, it's six-pack beach explosion. So people go there in one hour of sit-ups variations. During one session, you should do your muscle balance. Means the first exercise I do is for the ventral core. The second exercise for the dorsal, the third for the side, the fourth is something combined. The fifth exercise is ventral again. So during one session, during the warm-up, when I do my 15 minutes core training, I do maybe three rounds, always with different exercises. But this way, I cover the muscle balance. And what does it mean, ventral core muscles? It doesn't mean here the six-pack. Core ventral, uh, ventral core muscle means starting with your fingertips, going through the arm, shoulder, chest, towards the toes, the whole muscle chain. And try to integrate as many muscles as possible. This is the goal. This is what I'm going to show you in the afternoon during some more specific exercises. And then the last step would be the sport specific approach. But what I see from many experiences from coaches, they start to work specific very early. Once you lose, like the train leaves the station with your basics, it's hard to get it back. When you have a 20 year old athlete, and you see, well, he's stiff, he has no uh, good uh, shoulder or core stability or pelvis, it's hard to get back. When you have young athletes, juvenile, children, that's where you have to work on all the basics first, before you go to specifics. Like in Austria, skiers, you see them ski boots, skiing nation, or Switzerland, ski boots standing on the Swiss ball and doing squats. They can handle it, but the question is, isn't that maybe too early if he's 12 years old? Maybe he, he can get, uh, get to that later. Maybe try to work on the basics first. So this is the order. Test, mobilize, and then go to the stability in the order. So how did we try uh, to systemize all these exercises? The first thing I've told you already, after body uh, parts, ventral, dorsal, lateral, and so on. The second thing is we have it divided into difficulty levels. So one one plus would be a 7 year old back pain patient, three three plus could be an Olympic athlete. The next one of the positions, A, B, C, D, lying with back to the ground, stomach side into standing. What I see, I was training also in Salzburg sometimes with uh, track and field athletes, and they knew Roman is coming, we have coach training, so I said please warm up, we do this core session. So they started to run, they run very nicely, one, two rounds. And then without saying what happened, each athlete took a mat, put it down, they laid down on their back, and they were waiting for the first core exercise. And I asked them, what are you doing while you lay down? Yeah, we do core. So this is in our head. We need a mat and we need to lay down to do core training. Of course you can do that, ABC, for children, for patients, for the basics. But as soon as possible, you should go to the specific position. And in athletics, it's standing. We should work a lot in standing. And it doesn't finish here. The next step would be in movement, in dynamics. And this is what I would like to show you today in the afternoon. Go away of the idea for core training we have to lay down. And then, of course, we uh, put also the equipment in. Everything you see on the internet, we try to integrate it. Slackline, TRX, no devices, weights, machines, and so on. Of course, we also try to do some team exercises. And at the end, when you look at it from all the 3,000 exercises, the system gives me the spe specific exercises, for example, here for a mechanic. So that's the big idea. I'd like to show you now some um, training examples to have a little more idea. So, old picture, black and white, but still good. Of course, it would be better to have a video, but when we compare this to ladies sprinting, I like the left one more. First of all, she's faster. When I look at the right one, I could be a track and field coach, I'm like, well, I'm not happy with the position of the leg whatsoever. Uh, we do have to do some more running, coordination running technique. But if I look at it very simple as a conditioning coach or physio, 
what I see, when she lands with the left foot, maybe she's just weak in the core, abductors, her pelvis falls down, her knee goes to the inside, and she loses the transfer of the forces. So I don't have to work on running technique. I get her out of the sprint, work on more core stability, most lateral, abductors, pelvis stability, and then get her back to the sport to get the transfer. So complex exit and complex view, but actually a simple answer. And we were talking about injury prevention. What if I don't do anything with this athlete? So I'm like, well, she's always second at the World Championship, second at the Olympics, but silver is silver. Let's leave the system like it is. Could be, but maybe after 30 years, this athlete goes to the doctor with all kinds of problems and pain, and she says she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand why she has the problems because she was never injured. No, she was never injured, but the reason why she has problems is because lack of quality of movement. And this is our uh, this is our goal to recognize, realize those compensations and to work on it from the beginning. Handball, when you look at this left and right picture again, the left one is more dynamic, he's jumping. Um, what I want to show you here, the posture is the first thing before I start to work on some technique. Imagine a javelin thrower who tries to throw a javelin but doesn't throw far, but his head position is like this, the passive position, and he has the javelin. I'm sure from the beginning he will not throw very far with that posture. So when you look at the head position of both of them on the right side, it's like the secretaries always explain working on the desk where after a while they fall into passive structure. The head, the chin is going to the forward, extension, translation. So this is the bad position. To have a good position of the spine, I just explain, bring your head in a flexion and look what the spine does. Hop, the spine gets in the upright position. So before you correct some techniques, check the head position. Flex your head, the nose will down, also the eyes, and then you have upright position. This is bad, this is good. Before you go further. The next thing when we look at the extremities, the right one, his foot is an internal rotation, also the arm and then the head, and then he tries to throw. Not much dynamics. And we know this position from medicine, from when you have a patient with spasm. Spasm is the same thing. What do we do in physiotherapy? We try to open it up by not going to the external rotation, abduction, extension. So this is the upright position. This is bad, this is good. How should we transfer it to training? I don't want to destroy my thing here. I'm gonna show you. For example, you work with an athlete and you say, well, let's work on some sit-ups as a variation. Let's take the ball, put it between the knees, squeeze it here and do some sit-ups, should be good. Idea is not so bad, but once you put it between, you activate again to the inside. So maybe better have a thermal around to push to the outside, to open it up. It doesn't mean that it's exciting, the ball between the legs is bad. What athlete could use it? For example, a soccer player who is weak in the core and has always adaptive problems. Then it's okay. But for most of them who have bad posture, it doesn't make sense to activate them to the inside. So before you use some devices to put something between the knees and so on, think about it. Is it good for him? Or maybe do we do the opposite way? It's always individual. Here's a picture of Kamui Kobayashi uh, training in Austria on the neck stability. Formula One drivers did a lot of neck stability. And I saw this device the first time and he sits in the chair, which is really good. It's very specific. It's actually the shape of the seat he has in the racing car. And then he has his helmet on with the strings and he works on the next stability with heavy weights. So he's sitting there a few times, then he sits there, looks around for three, four minutes to wait for the next set. I saw it, I'm like, yeah, this is cool. Very specific next stability. But I wanted to know the specific activity for the neck. So they took me, Nürburgring, one, one leg, uh, with a professional driver, it was like over 300 kilometers per hour, and I didn't feel anything about 
all I felt was <laughs> all the time reactive. So I'm like, okay, well, this is strength. That's the first part, basics. But then if we have some any problems, we have to bring it to the specifics. So we adapted the training by letting weights fall down, close the eyes, to catch it, to activate the dorsal system in a reactive way. The same thing, the hand is free to catch it for the ventral system. It doesn't mean that Kakamui will catch balls all the time. It means that sometimes we need to transfer it to the actual sport. My coach, when we're preparing for the Olympics, we spend six hours a day in the gym. I was double size of now, my chest was like this, and I walked like this to lunch. I felt strong, but I knew if I would have to have a judo fight right now, I would lose against everyone. I couldn't move. There was no transfer. After the World Championships, when we were fighting, the whole team sucked. So, yeah, first round, everybody out. They fired the coach. We got a new coach from the Netherlands. And we were like, please, don't spend us so much time in the gym. Again, new coach, five, six hours in the week, gym. Again, just weightlifting, bench press and everything. We were like, oh no, the same thing for the next three, four years. But the coach said at the end, okay, last 10 minutes, put in a judo gi, go on a judo mat, and do some specific movements with your partner. So it gave us the transfer for the structures the way we, uh, we need it. So when you have an athlete for running, jumping whatsoever, you can do heavy training sessions, but then try to let them do some specific movements. So it's not like, yeah, I feel strong, but ways to transfer to the actual sport. One picture from judo or wrestling, what we use um, also with children, 12, 13 years old, to escape from the hold down, which is a cool exercise. So as a judo coach, I'm very happy about it. But on the other side, I'm a physiotherapist. I'm shocked about it. So what, who am I, physio or a judo coach? So if the 12 year old child says, I want to compete at a tournament, what do I do? If I'm a physio and tell him, this is not healthy. Well, yeah, it's true, it's not healthy. We skip this, but you can go to the tournament. In the tournament, the other child will hold him down. He tries to escape and the activity on the leg will be 10 times higher. So the answer is, we have to work on it. And we have to understand one thing. When we work on sports, sport is not healthy. There is only maybe one sport that might be healthy without injuries. <laughs> but everything else with the loads we have, it's not healthy. So in judo, we need the next stability in a specific position. So I will do it with a 12, 13 year old child to prepare the structures for the activity. So we have to have a big difference between sports activity and healthy movement. So in sports, don't be afraid to go into structures in a very specific way. I'll show you some more examples. Here, to have a global picture, um, what I want to show you here, the pelvis area. Very nice to see the hip extension to activate with the ventral system. Very cool. But if you see many athletes and you ask them, so how do you work on the core? And they come, yeah, my favorite is here. My crutches will sit up, so how you call it? It's very nice. I can do 300 here, very nice. But when you stand up and put in the same position, 90 degrees hip flexion, I don't think they need the ventral activity. So here you have to integrate the hip extension. So the hip is a very important joint, what I will show you in the afternoon. Go away from the small range of motion. In high jump, jump, all world, you need hip extension. One short story, I had a hockey player in my clinic with a lot of knee problems, and we went through the whole sport therapy, core stability, pelvic stability, uh, leg stability, because his cartilage was really bad, it was cross ligament and so on. And you think, well, skating should be fine for the leg axis, but yeah, he said, no, I'm the goalie. Mm -hmm. I'm in this position for two hours, and his knee was really bad. So what did I do? Sport physio, core stability, abductors, squat, everything. And when we did, for example, squats, 
four, five sets. The last set, I gave him some weights outside of the feet. Easier weight, maybe 20 kilograms. And let him do squats like this. I know it doesn't look nice, but if the goalie is not able to do 20 squats with 20 kilograms, he shouldn't go on the ice. And this is the idea. Prepare the structures for the activity. So if you work with him just in one axis, he can go on the ice, but after five or 10 minutes, his knee will react and it will be over again. Here, just example from rowing. Rowing is a very unhealthy sport. Flex spine for the discus, and then the maximum pulling, so it's like squeezing the discus out of the spine. We could tell the rowers, please, next time at the Olympics, try to have your back straight, you will be last, but it's prevention, it's healthier, they don't care. But what can we do? When we look at the spinal left one, which is very flexed, uh, the goal would be to have it more in a neutral position, but the movement they lose from the spine, they should gain by the hip. So hip mobility is the main topic, I could say, for every sport. Skiers, if the skiers loses with one ski and the hip is stiff and it cannot compensate with the hip, the next joint that suffers is the knee. So there are knee injuries because of lack of mobility of the hip joint. So the main topic today for the first 20 minutes in the two groups will be dynamic and functional hip mobility training, which is always the main topic. Of course, steady dynamic differences. If you have a pole wall to high jump, which is very dynamic movement, you can put him in a plank and the set tell him, hold it for three seconds. It's okay for him, but it doesn't make him a better high jumper. High jumper really needs dynamic stuff. If it's archery and the archery athlete throws medicine balls against the wall, she can do it, but it doesn't mean she will become a better archery athlete. So here also change the activities. And you see, of course, if there's a lack of mobility, you will not perform well. So the mobility is topic number one before we go to stability and strength. I'd like to show you one more thing. We are good in time. about quality of movement. So the goal is to have a big range of motion. Quality of movement, prevention of injuries and performance. We talked about it. If somebody is just strong but stiff, he will not perform well, he will get maybe knee problems and so on. So don't forget the mobility part. This is the big picture. We are going five steps back into the big picture of the body. The neck has a lot of movement. Here we should stabilize, like the Formula 1 drivers. Here, the thoracic spine, connected with the ribs, is most of the time very stiff. From 10 people, 8 people are stiff in the thoracic spine. If they are stiff here, what happens? No movement here at all the lumbar spine is moving too much. So the reason why many people have back pain is not maybe only the lack of stability, but the lack of mobility here. So here, mobilize. Lower back, core stability. Then we're on the hip joint. As I said, hip mobility important. The same thing, if the hip joint is limited, for example, into extension, here's the limitation, but I need a range of motion and I help with my lower back, I can again have back pain. So the back pain can be because of lack of mobility of the hip joint. That's why the big picture is important. And I always say, when you have some problems, let's say back pain, you have always to go one floor higher and one floor lower to check. Back pain, okay, how is the mobility here? How is the mobility here? Before I just tell him, yeah, you have to do more sit-ups or core stability. So, See the big picture. Then we, the knee should be more mostly stabilized. Ankle joint, tennis stiff. 
mostly the dorsal extension, has an effect on compensation, needs to be mobilized. But as Martin and Herbert said, it's all individual. So if I have the patient who has the problem with the running in the forest with the ankle joint, he will stabilize. But in general, this is the big picture. But for everyone, it can be the opposite. Here just to have the big picture of the lower extremity, which is very important for your sports, pole and high jump. We see the hip joint, if it's stiff, has an impact on the lower back. And you see that the ankle joint is shown bigger than the knee. When people say, I have a knee problem, I have to work on my knee, you cannot work on the knee joint, it's just a joint. It's, a, it's stabilized by several muscle chains. If you have a good position situation here, hip is mobile, good abductors, that pelvis is okay, but maybe they are still losing it because maybe they have flat feet. So the knee joint is just a result of the situation on top and of the situation down here. So every time I have someone, an athlete, who tells me he has knee problem, again, go one floor higher, go one floor, uh, floor lower. So if he runs marathons, I would suggest to have some supporting shoes. Otherwise, the knee will suffer. If the feet are fine, but he still has knee problems, maybe it's the lack of stability of the abductors. So again, see the big picture. And you see here, the mobility, different sports, the, uh, uh, dependent on the requirements for the sport. Mobility is a main topic. If people are just strong, they will not perform well. So we have the part, mobility, flexibility. I will not separate these two. Sometimes it's the joint itself with the, with the capsule. Sometimes it's the muscle, sometimes it's the fascia. So mobility, flexibility, it's just a method. The one is steady, the other more dynamic, and so on. So the goal is range of motion. For the stability part, as we heard, is the muscle balance. So how do we try to improve mobility? The first, we try to release the tension in structures by using foam rollers, and so this is modern nowadays to help to release the tension, or you have a massage therapist, then even, uh, even more comfortable. The second step is to uh, increase the mobility of the joint itself. Number three is the mobility flexibility, what we know, mobility exercises. Flexibility exercises. But our main topic today will be not to go to the static positions, what we used to do and what we all, all know, but to do three-dimensional dynamic movements where people see more improvement even after five minutes. We did it also last week with Christina with the Polo Jumpers of Germany and after 10 minutes they felt already big difference. I will just show you a few videos. And at the end, of course, you can also help to uh, activate the antagonist to improve the flexibility. And the last thing I'm going to show you, just a few videos, what we'll do today also with the athletes, but to have already a little bit of an overview. <coughs> so we have these four points. So for the traction, for the joint, you don't need always a physio. You can activate it by yourself to use a bristle uh, band and just have to pull on the joint and do extra movement like adduction, abduction. You can do the same thing with a pull on the joint to combine it with flexion extension as a dynamic way of improving, improving the mobility. Here, dynamic mobility flexibility exercises. Hello. Interesting. Show you the next one. 
Yes. Here, dynamic with external rotation. So everything dynamic way, if you say, okay, you stay for one second, two seconds or longer, it's up to you. The next possibility is to have the hip abduction, to have it combined with extra hip flexion, hip extension, change the position of the hip, make it more dynamic. The next thing is to have the hip abduction to combine it with rotation of the body. The next thing is, what we can combine, is to have the hip flexion and abduction in the starting position and to combine it with rotation of the spine. Of course, you can stay longer to hold the position or you can make it in dynamic of one second. It's up to you how you define the training method. It's just the movements. We can move on. This is very interesting, very nice position to have external rotation in this hip joint, internal rotation in the other hip joint. And again, to combine it with the flexion and extension to make it 3D. Those who are stiff, like me for example, I cannot even sit in this position and feel comfortable. So for me it's mission impossible. But you see immediately when you work with athletes on the quality, if they can handle it. The same thing you can combine again with the spine and the hip joint. Then other possibilities to uh, combine the hip flexion, hip extension in a dynamic way. So a way from the typical static positions, but make it more dynamic. It can be part of the warm-up, it can be part of the cool-down. It's up to you. The next combination can be with the hip extension, the left side, and the hip external rotation. So make it, again, dynamic and 3D. Then you can go even more into dynamics. The old school mobility exercises in Japan, it's very nice to see in all the judo universities. They let them do it for 15 minutes or longer. The old traditional duck walk. For the Europeans, not very comfortable. Japanese, they can read newspapers. They are very flexible in the hip joint. So for them, very comfortable. The next to combine it in more dynamic way, just a big step forward to work on the hip extension one side, hip flexion on the other side. The other thing is to combine it again with more external rotation. So keep it dynamic. Of course you can do steady positions as usual, but to improve the mobility before the actual sports training, you can integrate these. Some variations. White squat, sumo. To make it dynamic, it's a mobility exercise in a dynamic way. And at the end, when you do all kinds of these exercises, you should have again to transfer to the actual sport, like Kobayashi with the balls. So at the end, I let the athletes do some dynamic movements to give the structures the information we need this way. So, So what did we try to develop? Our, as I said, with the UEFA, we tried to develop screening tests and training um, concepts also for the International Champions League and Euro referees. Um, also we use it for players to increase, to get better in mobility. But if you tell a soccer player Okay, you have to mobilize in 3D your hip joint, you have to stretch this one, don't forget the quadriceps, don't forget your ankle joint, and so on. They're like, okay, there are 20 exercises, you lose 50%. First of all, they don't remember everything. Second of all, keep it short. So at the end, the effect is very low. So what we try to do, to give the coaches idea to create a movement drill. It's like a... Um, choreography of movements that the athletes learn like a poem. They learn it once and then all the coach says, today, one round. You are stiff, you do another two rounds at home. And one round takes maybe one and a half minutes. And you integrate all the movements you think the athlete needs. And then you covered the topic mobility and flexibility. At the beginning or at the end, or if it's really a stiff person, you tell him your goal is five times a day, you do one drill. 
I'm going to show you just one possibility with the main topics. So here we see starting with the ankle joint to work on the dorsal extension, then to have the hip extend on the left side combined with the little core. Then mobilizing the hip joint, front movement and also with the abduction. Just mobilize the hip in the extension. Then we have the combination of the hip joint and in the flex extension. If you say it's quadriceps it of source, don't think too much about muscles, think about the movements you do. Then a combined movement of hip extension on the left and the external rotation on the left. And then learn it like a point, like I said. Then walking again. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side. And if you think, well, my athlete is really stiff in the third spine, then you integrate more exercises for the third spine. And you tell them every position you do, you do it five times, and every position you do, you hold it for five seconds. This is just one possibility. So again, combine it, then we integrate the external rotation. These are just ideas. And every idea is nice, and you do it more individual for your athletes. Then from here, we will go to the abduction of the hip joint, to stretch and to mobilize the hip joint, reflection and extension again. Then we bring that into the right squat and make it more functional with the duck walk. Then they stand up and walk. And we did similar to that with the Volvo jumpers last week in Leverkusen. And you could feel the athletes after one and a half minutes, oh, feels better. And then maybe you take them and make the more specific activities. But as I said before, as this guy said, before you do the specific stuff, work on the basics. It doesn't mean for the whole season, it also means for every training session. If you know you need a lot of hip mobility for your pole vault, then you integrate it into the warm-up. So create your own drill, let them make it one or two times, and the thing is covered before you are standing there as a coach. Do this exercise, now we did this, let's do that. Oh, we forgot that one, let's come here back. No, no, one poem, and it's done. And of course, when we have here the high jumpers and the pole vaulters, there are different topics. From my, I'm not a specialist, but what I see for the pole vault, we need a lot of hip mobility. For the high jump, hip and third spine. That's the mobility part. When I see the stability part, the pole vaulters need, of course, core stability, a lot of pelvis stability, and for the arms, the shoulder stability. I will show you today, because many people work on the shoulder for the rotator cuff, which is nice, but with the pole, with the, uh, pole vault, you have actually here the open chain, and then you have the closed chain for the shoulder. So how can you work on the rotator cuff in the closed chain with the contact to the training device? We'll show you this afternoon. And for the high jumpers, it's more also important to integrate here the rotation of the lower extremity in the hip joint, ankle and the knee joint. So go away, always to do one with the axis, also try to integrate different rotations. So these are the practical ideas we will show you this afternoon. Um, from our view, well, we work already now 15, almost 15 years with all our system. Um, and for those who are interested in what we do, of course, we travel around the world and teach uh, level one to three for core, upper limbs, lower limbs, more specific for physiotherapists or coaches and so on. The other thing that we do is um, we try to make the creation of planning easier for coaches. We worked on it for the last 12 years to create a training application. If you are interested, you can go to my colleague Kutaro, he will show it to you. But I just want to show you that we created a training application where you create programs in 
actually one or two minutes, very uh, specific. This is not the software, this is just the application for the athlete. So the coach has the software, creates a plan in two minutes, and then the athlete has his plans, basically or on the individual part, where he has the pictures, what he has to do, he has the videos to the exercises, the parameters to the exercises, and so on. So this is what we developed the last 10-15 years. Now we have 3,000 exercises every time we see new things, new devices, new exercises. We integrate it into that. And since we teach here at the Trainers Academy, the Olympic coaches of Germany said, well, this is nice, but what about my sailing specific exercise? Is it there? I'm not a sailor. So we have also the part in our software where coaches can integrate their own exercises so the software is growing, it never ends. But if you are interested, there is also a, a version for free to play with it, to try it out. Taro is your guy. And because it, like, this, uh, like Herbert and Martin said, it's nice to, for example, do a lot of testings. But if you don't know what to do with it, how does it help? The same thing for us. We have a lot of ideas what we do with our patients and athletes. But then if I don't see that for weeks, it doesn't help. So we need an application where we are sure they continue to do it. That's why we develop the system. And yeah, I'm looking forward. I was very quick today. I'm looking forward to um, see you in the afternoon and to show you the same approach, the same idea of the big picture in the practical way. Little differences between pole vault and high jump to integrate, but always to make you understand first the basics before you start to work on the specific technique, changing, whatever, the details. See the big picture and then I think you should be fine. Thank you very much for your attention and see you this afternoon.
long term. And we heard it, it's the frequency that makes the difference. Not to say, well, Sunday, I do two hours of mobility flexibility. There you go, cover for the week. It doesn't help. If you do every day five to 10 minutes, you win a lot. So that's why not to change anything, integrate it in warm-up routines, and then it should be good. People are hungry. Yeah, good question. He, his question was if I would recommend it to the, to the beginning or at the end. And then we are again, like this guy said, it's individual. Some people have more effect on it when they do it at the beginning of the session, and some people have a better feeling to improve when they do it at the end. I can use my drill, for example, in the beginning to be more dynamic, to activate it for the session. And the same drill at the end, but it's a different definition. I tell you, okay, you don't do five reps for each movement, you do just do two reps, but in each movement you stay for five seconds. So you can, again, you can play with it. So the mobility part, like you said, can be in the beginning or at the end as a cool down. Just define the training method. I don't think that at the end of the session you will do a lot of dynamics anymore, maybe that more in the beginning. And after the session, you do it slow and maybe holding positions for a longer time. Yeah? Good. Great. So I think they're ready for the Yeah, moment. thank you. Thank you very much for the moment, Roman. You will be around the all afternoon, yes. starting with the holders and later on with the high conference. Please, before everyone heads for lunch now, uh, just give me, for those who are not too familiar with the place, let me give you a short idea how it works after the lunch break. So the wall, will, the afternoon it will be separated into the high, high jump group and pole wall group. Till now we had common topics where we believe that will be of a, a major interest for everyone. But we are happy, the high campers are happy to get rid of these holders the afternoon. So uh, we may be two separate groups. Uh, this is how it works, you will find it in the program. The pole vault groups, they will start with Roman with a practical demonstration at 2 p.m. in the track and field hall. I think most of you will know where it is, otherwise follow the others, we will have uh, uh, speaker, uh, yeah, my mic's there as well, and uh, you will find the place. So you will start there for maybe uh, 60, 70 minutes, something like that. Then on the way back, have a coffee and come back to this place afterwards to uh, one presentation of our guests from the US and then a chat talk together with Herbert Chin on everything is event specific for the high jump. So you start in the hall, the pole holders and come back here. Uh, the other way around for the high jumpers, uh, we will start here in this lecture hall two o'clock with a presentation of our high jump coach Amash Kish and then later on from here we will take your place in the track and field hall, coming for a practical in the high jump first, and then your special ideas on high jump also in the hall. There is just one small thing in the afternoon for the high jump group. Tamash will go to lecture in gym, so we must make it the other way around. Those who do not understand German collect together with our interpreter, if the group is too big, then we will make it a summary translation. Uh, in the practical, it shouldn't be a problem, but we, we will find a way and we will sort it out. I have no worries. <laughs> and then we come together for our banquet tonight, seven o'clock in the dining hall, uh, all groups together. Last, very last thing, 
the soccer match will start in uh, in almost one hour, one o'clock. So for the moment, it might be a little bit tricky to leave the place. No chance, chance to leave, but no chance to come back. So be well aware of that. And see you later in the afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>